Mrs. Price, thank you so much for your time. It's a busy time at Ben and Dinner with the start of term, and we're very grateful for the time you have taken out of your schedule to meet us today. Hello, and uh, thank you very much indeed for, for inviting me to speak to you today. It's, today. it's a, a great pleasure, and um, I'm, I'm delighted to talk about anything to do with Ben and Dinn. Thank you. So the past few years have been quite unconventional. Um, for the world, we had COVID and the year prior, we had um, the political situation in Hong Kong. And yeah. so uh, we've had a lot of movements um, within the international education arena. We have parents changing their minds when it comes to deciding on what school they should go to, whether they should go abroad, etc. So we thought it'd be great for us to hear firsthand from um, the heads of top independent schools in the UK as to how you see um, uh, schooling now in Benenden and um, how things are going, especially post COVID. So COVID has been a challenging year for yourself, I'm sure as well for the school. So how has the school adapted so far and what kind of strategies have you put in place to ensure students safety? Thank you very much indeed. So yes, I completely concur. The last 12 months uh, has presented us with consistent challenges, but I'm delighted to say that I think as a school, we've come through them uh, stronger and closer as a community than ever. Um, it's also when we reflect back, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to look at uh, whole staff professional development, because there was no doubt that we have upskilled whole scale in terms of our understanding of technology and obviously being able to teach online. So if if I take us back to this time last year when uh, the UK went into lockdown uh, for the first time, uh, we anticipated actually what was going to happen uh, here at school and, uh, and therefore we actually let our international students leave uh, up to two weeks before the, the, the English schools closed because we wanted to make sure that those students could get home. Um, but in order to do that and uh, recognising that the UK was likely to go into lockdown, we actually um, we started to train the staff very, very intensively and very quickly to be able to teach the whole timetable online. And that meant that from um, as soon as the school had to close on the 18th of March, um, we were able to then literally just continue with Benden across the globe online. And we managed to keep that going right through the pandemic. Um, we To do that in order to be able to best support our international students and time differences, we actually changed the time of the timetable. We brought it forward um, so that international students weren't going to bed too late, um, albeit particularly that some of our girls in Hong Kong, they were still finishing lessons at about 11 at night, um, but then they got the lion in the morning. Uh, so it, it, it has worked it well. And we've had some students from Hong Kong who've actually been working online uh, for the duration of the academic year. They're still very much engaged with us. They're still very much engaged with the pastoral staff and they're still doing music lessons online and Lambda lessons and so on. So that's worked very, very well. We then um, reopened the school in September um, with COVID restrictions and we worked as a senior team right through the summer on risk assessments and ensuring that we had every possible provision in place to be able to manage um, the new term with girls coming back on site. And uh, we also um, operated a quarantine provision, which we've continued with for those overseas students who did come back for the beginning of the autumn term. We were also in a, in a, in a very strong position because we were able to purchase our own uh, point of contact testing device, uh, thanks to the support of the school and then also parents. We now have two of those. Um, which meant that even back last September, before lateral flow testing um, was prevalent, we were in a position to be able to test anybody quickly who was symptomatic. We also restructured how we organised our boarding houses. So rather than having what we call vertical houses, where you've got different year groups in a house, we actually reverted to horizontal boarding. So we boarded the girls by year groups. And the reason for that was that if we did have an outbreak in, the, in a year group, um, it meant we could just lock a year group down in their boarding houses without it spreading um, through other boarding houses. And that has worked incredibly effectively over the course of the year. So we have had some positive cases in school. Um, and when we have had positive cases, first and foremost, the students um, who have been tested positive um, have had flu-like symptoms. Um, they have felt unwell for a few days and then they've recovered very, very quickly. So it's not been serious. Um, but 
what they've also been able to do is whilst they've been in quarantine, they could uh, straight away just continue with all of their lessons, but online. And um, we were able to then lock down uh, a couple of boarding houses for up to 10 days at a time. And that meant the school could completely operate. Uh, so in, in a very, very difficult situation, um, I would say that we've managed exceptionally well. Well, that's really impressive, especially all the coordination from operations and pedagogical development. Um, I've heard great things from Benedict alumni regarding the online uh, provision. And yeah. uh, that's really kudos to the teachers who have been very creative. They've been fantastic. Yeah. Despite that, um, I'm sure some students would have preferred um, in-person teaching over online. And uh, we also know in general, some students just don't take to online that well, in particular for sciences where you have practicums usually. Has a school or faculty members noticed any learning gaps? If so, uh, what kind of provision will be in place to help students bridge these learning gaps, especially those who have either missed public examinations because they've been cancelled or those who will be embracing public exams going forward? Okay, it's a very, very good question. I think uh, internationally and certainly nationally, um, all of our students here with online learning have had a Rolls Royce educational experience through coronavirus, um, because you look at the majority who've had very little teaching or effective teaching during the lockdowns. So where our students are compared to the vast majority, um, they are in a very, very much stronger place. Um, having tracked the progress of students across all of the year groups of online learning, um, surprisingly, we have seen very, very little in terms of students being behind where we would expect them to be. Um, and from that point of view, it's proven to us that the online learning has been effective. Um, there's nothing that obviously can replace the face-to-face -face teaching and um, sort of the daily interaction with your teachers. And also, as you say, being able to do experiments in the laboratories and so on. So I think in terms of practicals, um, those are probably the areas where there are the most gaps. Um, in terms of students sitting public exams this year, which have been cancelled, um, that hasn't been so much of an issue. But for students who are going to be sitting A-levels and GCSEs next year, um, we will be looking to help them to catch up. Now, with the students we've got back on site now, we've got 95% of the student body now back on site. Those students are all catching up this term. In September, when we have the whole student cohort, we hope back, um, we will offer more catch-up sessions if required. And if we have any overseas students who are still not back in September, then we're looking to actually liaise uh, with some of the international schools, potentially in Hong Kong, for example, to see whether or not they can help us or help those students to catch up with those practicals. And um, we do very regular testings here at the school anyway, and we do baseline testing. So we've got a very clear understanding regularly of where the students are in terms of the progress that they need to, to catch up with. That's great. Um, and in general, uh, we have seen the same amount of interest, if not more, going to certain top independent schools in the UK, precisely because of the resources the school is able to put into these uh, very radical changes uh, to delivering quality education. So Benenden, I know, runs a few years of wait lists at certain entry points. Um, can you share with us a little bit more about Benenden's education ethos? What are the unique selling points of Benenden? Okay, so I'll start with the ethos of the school. So everything around Benenden is uh, centered around uh, an educational program which we call a complete education um, and this isn't just a term that's used it's actually a program which has been very very carefully structured um, and evolved over the course of the last six years and the concept of the complete education is that you put every child at the center and you think of three concentric circles and with your child in the center with the three concentric circles around her those concentric circles represent everything that she will experience and have the opportunities to experience while she's here at the school. So if we take the, the middle um, concentric circle, first of all, that's our academic programme, our co-curricular programme and our personal and professional development. 
Development Programme. And our academic programme, I think, is second to none in the UK. It combines and blends a very, very strong um, attention to, uh, to, to intellectual and academic detail. Um, it also provides innovation. Uh, so we want our students to be very thoroughly educated, to have uh, all of the traditional education that you would expect to the very highest standard in terms of knowledge and skills. But the initiatives that we adopt at the school, um, which specifically uh, encompass in inquiry-based learning, really teach our students to be able to think for themselves, to be able to um, dissect very complex problems, and to be able to think strategically. And those are key skills which not only help them to achieve at GCSE and at A-level and university, but those key skills are what they need uh, to go into uh, their professional lives beyond school. And part of the reason that we actually created this programme, this academic programme specifically, was in response to what employers were telling us that they felt were the gaps with graduates coming into the workplace. Um, we take a similar approach with the co-curricular program. So the co-curricular program, yes, we've got fantastic music, we've got wonderful sport, um, we've got a superb outdoor program and drama and ballet. Um, but combined with that, we've also got some deeply intellectual but practically intellectual initiatives as well. So for example, as part of our co-curricular program, we have the Microlite Aeroplane Engineering Club. And uh, three years ago, we the, the girls from a flat pack, they built um, a Microlite Aeroplane. Um, it said, go girls on the wings. And I had the great privilege of being able to fly in this aeroplane with the pilot. Um, and when I was sitting in the cockpit and I was looking up, every single bolt that had been turned in that aeroplane had been done by a Benenden girl. So I felt this enormous amount of pride. And flying over the school on a Sunday morning in beautiful sunshine in an aeroplane built by my pupils was something that was very special indeed. And I did land safely, so, so all was good. And, um, and then the following year, we actually built a caterham car, beautiful caterham car. Again, I had the great privilege of being able to drive that through the village, which was fun. And we're about to build another aeroplane. Um, but the next aeroplane we're building is going to be able to actually fly um, around Britain. So it's going to be able to do a much longer distance. Uh, and I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to that. So, you know, you think about um, engineering projects like that, and you often associate those, those sorts of projects with boys and boys schools. You don't think of a team of 20 girls with members of staff every Tuesday evening building this over a period of time. So that innovation um, and that challenge, and I think sort of just showing the girls what they can do um, is something that's completely unique. Um, we're also very, very concerned about helping the girls to develop um, balance in their lives um, and uh, sort of physical well-being and mental well-being and recognising right from the, 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 the time they start here in the school how you can achieve that. And, and therefore how to balance your time really effectively. So we've got a very structured program to support the students with that. Um, alongside all of that, we also pride ourselves on the depth of our community here. You know, we're 550 girls at Benenden. Every girl is known and every girl is known for who she is. And uh, we want her to follow her own interests. We want her to be able to feel very comfortable to be her own person. And student leadership, particularly from the, the senior girls through the school community, again, is incredibly important because you get this sort of this spirit of aspiration, which is being driven, yes, from the staff, but very much from the students. So it's a very vibrant, it's a happy community. Yes, the girls work very hard. They go through stressful times, but they also receive a huge amount of support. Yes, it's really amazing because even from my own experience, I find Benenden being a very inclusive school. So um, from what I gathered, even the plain project, they do not just confine it to engineering um, aspiring students, but any student who's interested to participate can actually participate. You know, complete education is a fantastic uh, philosophy and more amazingly is that it is being executed. Uh, on the ground uh, through the curriculums. So what are the upcoming strategic goals of the school to uh, potentially you know, broaden its exposure to more students? So um, we are, we're going to be taking one of our um, 
our online programs as a sample, um, and then we're going to grow this further. And we're going to be sharing our online programs both nationally with local schools, particularly subjects which are not quite so common across the sectors. So, for example, politics is one of our strongest A-level subjects here at the school. Um, economics is extremely strong here. Latin and Greek are very strong. So we're going to uh, record those courses and we're going to upload them. We're going to enable greater access. And then in time, what we would like to also be able to do is to do that on a more of an international basis as well. So we're just sort of taking that quite gradually at the moment, but we're very excited because it means that students across the globe eventually will be able to have an access to our approach to education with some of the courses that we are most proud of here at the school. And actually, we'd like to try to extend that with some of the practical courses as well. Um, so we're, we're, but we're working quite hard at the moment to be able to identify how we do that. I suppose more broadly, um, and uh, Jennifer, you will know this, uh, we're also working very, very closely with CTF EG, and um, we have got our own international schools, which we're going to be opening, um, Bellenden International, um, in, in collaboration with CTF EG, and we hope to be working very, very closely in terms of um, being able to blend aspects of the, the Bellenden curriculum with the international schools in China, and I think that there'll be a lot of opportunities opportunity through technology specifically to be able to, to really facilitate and support that. Great. And I heard Benenden is taking a few day school students. You know, what's the scale of that? So we are introducing what we call a few day boarders. Um, and the reason we're calling our day boarders uh, day boarders rather than day girls is because they're joining a full boarding school. So uh, what these students will do is they will literally come in um, and they will spend the whole day and do all of our activities here with us and they will just go home to sleep. So the initiative really is to support local students whose parents can't justify sending them to a full boarding school when they live a couple of miles away. And uh, we've got, we are gonna be growing those numbers to about uh, 50 in total out of the whole pupil role, which will, will evolve up to 60. 600 in time. So if you um, if you look at those student numbers across all the year groups, it's actually going to be fairly modest. You know, being practical minded, a lot of um, international uh, parents would uh, send children abroad to UK boarding schools with the aspiration that they will ultimately get in top universities in the UK. Yeah. Uh, we have read a lot of news in Hong Kong, and it's actually not really new news. Um, uh, I know it's old news in the UK. For a while, that um, top institutions such as Oxbridge, I wouldn't say prioritizing, but increasing their intake from state uh, schools. Um, that, do you see any impact on the intake from independent schools? And um, how has Benedict seen um, your um, graduates' destinations um, changing or keeping up? So I, I would say that if I look at our graduates' destinations, um, our, our students are going on to the very top universities, both in the UK and also globally. What's been very interesting for us over the course of the last eight years is seeing the increase in interest in the US universities. And uh, we have a very, very strong provision, which has actually been sort of internationally regarded for the preparation that we give students to, to apply to the US. And we've got a number of students now who are at US Ivy League universities and even choosing those over Oxford and Cambridge and UCL. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the UK, uh, we've got the majority of our students, 90% uh, go to what you call the Russell Group Universities, um, and they apply and are successful in gaining places on the most competitive courses. Of course, St Andrews, which is a fabulous university in Bath, they're not Russell Group because they choose not to be. So we mustn't forget those other top universities um, within that as well. And every year we have a good number of students who still apply to Oxford and Cambridge. And yes, the, the Oxford and Cambridge are, are, are very inclusive and very consciously inclusive in terms of the, the students and the student profiles that they are offering places to. And therefore, what we are seeing is that there are more students from the state sector who are being given places. Um, that hasn't isn't necessarily to the detriment of independent students. Um, Oxford and Cambridge still want the very, very best academic potential coming into their universities, um, where it would be more of an impact to be a borderline students. 
um, who would, would, would not be successful in achieving a place at Oxford and Cambridge, but your very strong students who are going to bring a lot to universities, they are still securing places. Okay. So I would, um, I would encourage any parent, international parents, UK parents, not to be deterred by that and um, to, to trust the schools in terms of what they're doing to prepare every student to get the best university for them and to do the right course for them as well. Interestingly, you mentioned about the trend of students applying to U.S. universities. In fact, we are also seeing that as an increasing trend for students in, in particular who are quite multi-talented and have lots of yeah. Yeah. Uh, extracurricular interests beyond academics. Why do you think better than girls in particular um, are increasingly interested in the U.S. Uh, education system? What kind of um, extra provision within the school that uh, allows them to um, bolster the profile for U.S applications? Very good question. So I'll, I'll take the first piece um, uh, to begin with. And I think that, uh, that as you've touched on, the, the opportunities that the US universities present in terms of courses um, can be very, very appealing to students. The, the, the English system, obviously, we do A-levels, the gold, the international gold standard. Um, I would say A-levels still have in terms of the, um, the depth of, of education that students receive. But a number of students, when they're applying to university, um, they don't actually know necessarily exactly what course they want to do. They want more breadth still at 18 when they start university. Um, and that's what the US universities really provide. So if you know you love humanities, but you're not sure which area of humanities you really want to specialize in, um, that those students will be particularly interested in going to the US. And I think that um, the, the breadth of the education that we offer here uh, certainly supports our students to be able to do that. We give the students a lot of opportunity to, to run their own projects and to be able to take their own initiative um, and also to be able to obviously uh, really show leadership and uh, community initiatives as well. And that's what the US universities really like to see in the applications. They want to see an individual who is academically very driven, but also an individual who's going to really contribute to the university and campus life as well. And I am fairly certain that that's why we have such a strong success rate um, with the US universities. Um, I've also been informed um, by Harvard, actually, um, that we write amongst the best US references uh, right. to, um, and so we have been cited for that. And uh, I put that down to my fantastic careers team uh, who oversee all of that process. Yes, it must be a very different style of writing re uh, reference letters because UK is very much focused on academics, whereas US very much focused on the personality. I'm sure Benedict also is able to reference a lot of the anecdotes of the students, um, you know, extracurricular engagements to substantiate the reference. That's really excellent news, especially for international um, students who might want to have you know, broader options when it comes to tertiary education. On the point of you know, international movements, um, what about Brexit? How do you think Brexit might, um, or might have or will impact UK education in general and uh, directly or indirectly impacting UK independent schools? This is another very good question. In all honesty, I don't think Brexit's going to have a huge impact on UK school education. Uh, I, I think it will have more of an impact potentially on the university education um, in terms of sort of allocation of visas and complexity around visas. But interestingly, I don't think that's going to affect non-Europeans applying uh, for international places at universities. Uh, we were initially concerned that with, with Brexit, we would see a lot of international companies moving over to Europe and therefore potentially we may be losing students. Uh, so we, we haven't seen that. So yes, some international companies have moved, uh, but students are staying here uh, and parents' ability to be able to, to uh, meet the fee requirements here doesn't seem to be affected. So at the moment, uh, we feel very confident that, that Brexit's not going to have the impact that we thought it might do. Um, we do have a, a sort of a degree of restriction with regards to visas and allocation of visas. But again, for us, that's manageable because as a school, uh, we offer around 14% of visas anyway. And that's not something that we actively looking to, to increase. Well, um, the final question and probably the most 
interested question by international parents is, what do you look for in prospective applicants? And uh, I'm sure many of them, especially from Hong Kong, would have met the minimum academic requirements. And, you know, Benedict is also famous for ensuring that, you know, you take in um, a good applicants, but academics is not the only thing um, you look for. So that becomes quite qualitative um, in the evaluation. So how do you make that judgment? Is there any weighting to different aspects of evaluation? So what we're looking for is, uh, yes, we're looking for, for girls who are, have strong academic ability and also strong academic potential. I think alongside that, we're looking for students who are going to come into the school and they are going to throw themselves into what we've got to offer here. We have a very, very busy schedule here. Um, it's seven days a week because it's an all boarding school. Um, the girls obviously have all of their academic commitments, um, but then they are really strongly uh, encouraged and expected to do quite a lot of co-curricular and also to do community work as well. So we want students who are going to come here, make the most of those opportunities and, and really sort of give back to the Benenden community. And I think that uh, if your daughter is that sort of uh, individual, then she is somebody potentially who could thrive here. Um, and of course, then it would also be a good fit for her as well. Uh, and sometimes you can have a girl who is quite shy, um, but actually she's incredibly determined to really get involved. And, uh, and we find that actually she can make a huge difference to the school and really come out of herself. So it's not just about being gregarious. It's that inner core that wants to, to, to really get stuck into school life. So just last two questions. Okay. Um, second to last is, Weekends, you know, a lot of parents are concerned that independent schools now um, are boarding by offering. But when it comes to weekends, practically speaking, the school empties out. I, I know Benedict has quite a strong weekend provision. Yeah. Um, do you see students actually staying for these weekend um, activities? And um, do you think the weekend experience is now different from the, the, the past? So I think the weekend experience has gradually evolved um, from the past. And I would say that probably more girls do go out uh, at weekends. But when they do go out, it's for a very short period of time. And uh, actually, a lot of girls also choose to stay in at weekends. I would say that the weekend program has got stronger and stronger and stronger. And this last weekend, I had 100% of the school in. And um, we had every single year group out around the grounds until 8.30 at night all doing different evening activities. So I had my, my uh, year 11s who were dressed in cocktail dresses for a mocktail Great Gatsby 1920s evening, um, having an absolutely fantastic time. So I would say that weekends, you know, we pride ourselves on our weekends here at the school. They are very vibrant because we have lessons on Saturday mornings. There are matches and activities in the afternoons. And the girls can sort of every other weekend go home Saturday evening until Sunday evening. Um, but on average, we will have about 65 to 70 percent of the students who are in school at the weekends. And there's always a lot going on. And we also want to give the students time to be able to relax, if I'm honest with you, and have some time to themselves, too. So I think that, um, you know, one of one of the questions would be if you've got some day pupils coming in, is that going to affect weekends? And my answer to that is no. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I concur with the point on some me time, some downtime. They yeah. need some time to relax and uh, and think for themselves yeah. in general. Um, last question. Um, if you could describe better than girls in three adjectives, how would you describe better than girls? Uh, I will, I, I will, I'm going to describe them in one word, if I may. Yeah. Um, and that's ambitious. Mm. And uh, that's a, it's a wonderful combination of showing humility, but also being ambitious. Mm -hmm. And when you see Benenden seniors, you see that sort of that core of, uh, of ambition and, and drive. Uh, but it is couched in this, this sort of this lovely humility, um, which has a very strong sense of service about it as well. So I would take the word ambitious away. Wow, that's we great. A new, new vocabulary. And hopefully our seniors are living up to it. <laughs> you, I've got one in front of me on the screen. <laughs> Try hard. Um, great. Thank you so much, Mrs. Price. Lovely talking to you. And I must release you back to your busy schedule. Um, but thank you very much for your sharing today. It's been very, very useful for parents. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great thank to you. talk to you. Thank, thank you. you. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.